Uh, okay, so as you guys may or may not know, I'm one of the owner's students. Uh, owner is traveling this week, so I'll be giving the lecture both today and on Wednesday. Um, and as you can see, we'll be talking about interconnection networks this week. Um, oh, I just Cool. Pardon me one sec here. Okay, this is good. Great. Okay, uh, so interconnection networks. So you guys have talked about um, parallel systems in general so far, I think. Um, so the idea of an interconnection network is when you have a system that gets large enough, uh, you have multiple processors, multiple memory nodes, maybe multiple pieces of cache in the system, and they all need to connect together and communicate in a scalable way. Um, so that's in general what an interconnection network allows us to do. It allows us to connect uh, different elements of the system such that they can pass messages back and forth. Um, and we'll talk about sort of how they're built uh, today. So before I get into that, though, there are a few announcements, I think, from the course staff. Um, so you can ask Han if you have any questions. But I think you guys have um, a review due on, uh, I guess, Tuesday night, midnight, um, on one of the papers that we'll talk about uh, in these lectures. Um, so I'm sure you've seen that already. Uh, also, just some reminders on project milestones. So you guys apparently have a uh, milestone report due, I guess that's Saturday night, um, slides in a presentation. Um, so again, ask Khan or Professor Mutlu if you have more questions there. Um, just reminding you that you have that to do. OK, and then you guys need to sign up for a presentation slot. So make a lot of progress, find breakthroughs. OK, so uh, lots of readings. Um, I guess I sort of apologize for the volume, but uh, in some of our opinions, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, so uh, there are sort of a few fundamental papers here that um, we'll cover. One of them is uh, virtual channel flow control. So that's sort of the basis for uh, modern buffered virtual channel uh, interconnects, which we'll talk more about today. Uh, there is another paper, Mullins, which describes in a little more detail how those buffered routers work. Um, some sort of overview papers. Uh, so on chip interconnect uh, network of the tile architecture, or tile processor, talks about a recent uh, real system that was built with a mesh interconnect. Um, a few of uh, our group's papers, so two of um, uh, my papers with my collaborators that I'll talk about, I think, tomorrow or Wednesday, probably. Um, and then a few others as well. So you guys can go ahead and uh, take a look at that. Okay, so interconnection network. So I'm going to talk about three broad uh, sort of issues in interconnects today. Um, the first one that I'll talk about is just I'll give you an introduction um, and I'll talk about some high-level terminology so we all are talking the same language. Um, and then today I'll hopefully get to both topology, which is how the network is actually structured, so how the nodes are connected, uh, as well as buffering and flow control. So that's how uh, sort of traffic actually moves through the network and is allowed to move through the network. So I mentioned just briefly already, but uh, where and how are networks used? So interconnect networks are used to build large, scalable, parallel systems. And uh, in brief, or at a high level, interconnects connect multiple components in the system. Um, so you can think of many examples where interconnect networks might be used. For example, uh, if you have a multiprocessor system, one of the most basic examples is processors talk to each other. right? So if one processor has a cache block, for example, and another processor accesses that address, there needs to be some way so that the data in that cache block is transferred from one processor to another. Um, similarly, you can imagine if you have multiple banks of memory in your system, processors need a way to request data from different pieces of memory in the system, uh, likewise for caches. Uh, and then also, for example, if you have I.O. devices, so disk drives or flash uh, or something like that. Um, so it, we won't talk too much in detail about how uh, these specific components might, might connect to the network. We'll just sort of abstract away, uh, in, in this lecture at least, and we'll say there are just nodes in the system, and the nodes pass messages back and forth. Um, but nodes could be any of these things. So just to give sort of a few, um, a few basics, uh, different aspects of the design of interconnect networks. So one of the first considerations when you build a network is what is the topology? Uh, topology, in brief, means sort of the structure of the network. So if you have nodes, say you have a network of 64 nodes, there's a question of how do you wire between those nodes? You can imagine you could place the nodes, for example, in a, a mesh, which means like a 2D 
uh, structure, say eight uh, across by eight down, and just have nodes talk to their neighbors. Um, you could, in the most expensive case, have every node connect to every other node, right? So that's n squared links for n nodes. Um, and there are many design points in between those two. So the way that you choose to connect the nodes affects many things. It affects how you route messages, because the different paths that you build affect what choices you have when you send a message from here to here. Um, it also affects reliability. For example, you can have a topology where you have only one way to get from node A to node B, and if that link fails, then you have no way to send a message. Versus other topologies where you have a lot of links, maybe if a few links fail, you're still okay. You still have full connectivity. Um, other considerations, so the way that you choose your topology also affects performance, right? So throughput can be affected. For example, if you have uh, multiple sections of your network that are connected by fairly thin or cheap links, you don't have as much throughput from one side of the network to the other, versus if every node connects to every other, you have very high throughput or bandwidth. Um, latency, so if you have many hops to get from A to B, uh, then you have potentially a longer you know, time for a message to reach its destination versus if, again, if every node has a connection to every other node, that's just a single hop. Um, and then ease of building. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, if you have these very high dimensional structures, they may be nice in theory, but it can be hard to lay them out on a 2D chip, for example. Um, so I'll go into all of these in more detail, but this is just a high level overview of, uh, you know, the different aspects of topology um, and how it can affect the design. So the second concern, once you've decided how to build your network, is how do you route messages on your network, right? So routing, uh, in brief, means how does a message get from its source to its destination? And you can formalize this. You can say, given a, a graph in the computer science sense, uh, a routing function tells you, you know, which, which edges you take to get from one node to another. Um, but there are different uh, sort of ways that we can build routing algorithms in regular ways um, to, to allow us to make these decisions easier or harder. Uh, there are also different ways that we can, uh, you know, optimize for performance, for example. So adaptive routing means uh, actually considering network load when you route. So maybe when a message needs to get from point A to point B, there's some congestion and you try and route around the congestion, for example. So that's topology and routing. And then last, uh, and this is sort of orthogonal, is buffering and flow control, right? So once you've decided which path you're going to take in the network, there's still the question of, there are resources along the way, and you need to decide how you occupy, how you occupy those resources as you reach your destination. Um, so uh, sort of the conventional network design is that every node in the network that you traverse has some buffering. And as a message or a packet moves from one node to another, it stays in each buffer along the way. Right? So this is called store and forward uh, networking. You may have heard of this in like a networking class. Um, you can optimize on top of that, but then there are questions still of, how do you know there will be space in a buffer? Um, how do you allocate space in buffers? What happens when there's no buffering space? So there's some aspect of back pressure. Um, and then there are a lot of different uh, performance concerns there as well. Um, so I'll talk about all of these in more detail, but that's sort of a high level view. Um, so is all of this sort of clear so far in the big picture? Good. Okay, just to uh, give us some common terms so we can talk about different, um, different structures. So uh, first, we have nodes in the network, and nodes have network interfaces. So you can think of a node uh, in the network. Is there chalk somewhere? Okay. So you can think of a node in the network, abstractly, as having a few different components. So say, for example, we have a node, and it has a CPU, right, a processing core, and maybe it has some piece of the L2 cache, and then maybe it has uh, its own private L1 cache as well. And so the first thing that you need to do is, so say you have many of these in some sort of uh, chip multiprocessor, right? So maybe 64 of these in a, in a grid. Uh, the first thing you need to do to build an interconnect network is give each node a way to talk to the network, right? So this is called a network interface, or NI for short. And uh, you can sort of think of this as you know, an Ethernet card for the node, if you will. Um, so, you know, conventionally you have the NI, it'll talk to some piece of the network. And then maybe these network nodes are connected with some topology. Uh, so the, the network interface basically decouples the, uh, the node, uh, the, the compute element, uh, which is what the chip is actually built out of, um, from the network. Okay, the second thing, uh, so this is just sort of the basic building block of a network, is a link, 
Right, so at the most basic level, a link is just a set of wires. Uh, you can imagine that it could get a little more complex if you have long wires, for example. Maybe you have repeaters, maybe you have uh, pipeline latches, so maybe it takes multiple cycles uh, to traverse a link. But at a basic level, a link you can just think of as a set of wires, or maybe a bus. Uh, okay, the next element is a switch or a router. So basically, you can think of a switch as a device that connects multiple links and moves traffic or packets between the links. So say that we have some node in the network, and we have four links coming in from the four, you know, say this is a 2D mesh, so we have four links coming in from the four sides. Uh, this thing in the middle you can think of as a switch or a router. And so the basic job of this element of the network is that any traffic that arrives on some link uh, should somehow traverse through this switch and leave on another link. Okay. And then finally, uh, there are things called channels. So a channel is, uh, so uh, as we say here, a single logical connection between routers or switches. Uh, this is sort of logically distinct from a link. So uh, there are things called virtual channels, for example, and we can use these for breaking deadlock. Um, the idea is that you can actually, for example, have a single physical link between switches. See, here are two switches in the network. And so this is a single physical link. But we could, for example, time multiplex two channels on top of this link. So maybe in alternate cycles, uh, first uh, virtual channel zero, then virtual channel one traverse this link. Or you could have other multiplexing schemes. Um, but the basic idea is that a channel is a logical connection which is distinct from the physical link underneath. Okay. So I've sort of used these terms informally already, but uh, just to make sure we all know them. So a node uh, is a router or switch within a network. Um, so again, a node is just a thing that comes between links and is at a single point in the network. Um, a message is the unit of transfer for a network's client, so processor of memory. So you can think of a message basically as a packet. Um, and, and so uh, it could be distinct from a packet. For example, a message could consist of multiple packets. Um, but I'm going to sort of abstract away from that in this talk. Um, just to consider things at the network level. Um, so basically we have packets, which are the unit of transfer for the network, and, and packets can consist of multiple flits. So a flit is a flow control digit. Um, at a basic level you can think of a flit as the amount of data carried by a single link in a single cycle. So say this link is 128 bits wide, for example, a flit would be 128 bits, and so the link would carry one flit per cycle. Um, that's actually not quite precise. There are actually things called fits, which are uh, physical digits, and flits are made up of fits, but I won't go into that. Uh, you, you can think of a flit basically as the unit of uh, allocation for flow control, which is transfer over links and transfer into buffers. And packets consist of multiple flits. So to give you an idea, um, say that we have a network with a protocol that has two different types of packets. Maybe we have, I'll just talk very, high level, maybe we have data packets and maybe we have control packets, right? So as you can imagine, a control packet is probably pretty short, right? It's probably just, for example, an address saying to some node, hey, give me this cache block, right, at this address. A data packet, in contrast, is probably a little bit larger because it actually contains the data, right? Maybe it's a 64-byte cache block or something like that. And so typically, control will be maybe, a control packet will be maybe one flit and a da data packet maybe is, I don't know, four flits, something like that, just to give some uh, concrete data points. So uh, breaking up packets into multiple flits allows the network to be flexible in this regard. Basically, it allows you to have variable length packets. And this gives you better link utilization, right? Because otherwise, you would need a, a flit as large as a, a cache block. OK, is that all clear to everyone? Good. Yeah, feel free to stop me at any time, ask questions. I don't bite. Okay, a little more terminology. Um, so I've talked sort of abstractly. I, I've used this example of a 2D mesh. Um, but there's actually this distinction in topology, which is between direct and indirect networks. So you can imagine um, if you have a network um, between nodes, sort of the most basic design you can do, let's say we have a 16-core processor. We just put a router at every core. Say it's arranged as a 4 by 4 mesh. Put a router at every core and connect them directly. 
And so this would be called a direct network because every core has a router. Or seen from the network point of view, every router has a core. In contrast, uh, this concept of an indirect network is where we actually have endpoints. So th these are uh, destinations that send and receive messages that are distinct from switches. Right? So in a direct network, in this mesh example, any of these nodes can send a message to any other. But in an indirect network, maybe we have, let's say, four nodes. So these are, call them cores. We have four nodes. And then maybe there's some network of uh, switches. And so this could be some sort of uh, you know, permutation design or something like that. And then we have other, let's say, uh, let's call these, just to give a concrete example again, cash slices or cash banks. And so the distinction here is that these boxes in the middle are switches, but nodes can't send a message directly to a switch. Rather, any message always goes from a core to a cache bank. And so uh, in the indirect network, these switches just act as sort of this, this fabric uh, that transits messages. Right? So, so these switches don't send and receive. They just transit messages. Is that clear? OK. Ah, OK. So I guess we have an example, too. Um, so yeah, so here's a larger example of uh, the network that I just drew here. Um, so a few different aspects of terminology here. So there's this notion of, uh, of radix, which is basically the number of, or the degree of input and output links on these switches. So this is a two-ary indirect network. Um, okay, and then the distinction is against a direct network. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about topology. So topology, as I mentioned, is the way that nodes in the network connect. Uh, you can think of it as a graph structure if you come from computer science, but it's basically just the, the shape of the network, if you will. Um, and so the first distinction that I'm going to make is between regular and irregular topologies. So a regular topology is something basically that uh, has a regular structure, as the name implies. So if you have something like a mesh, that's regular because every node essentially is the same, right? Uh, modulo the edge effects. Um, you know, ignore that for now. But every node is basically the same. Uh, an irregular topology, in contrast, could be, for example, if you design a network where some nodes have different requirements than others. So to give an example, maybe we design a network where some of the nodes are cores and other nodes are memory controllers. As you can imagine, the memory controllers may be uh, hotspots for traffic, right? So we have a lot of contention to get to the memory controller. And so maybe we design a network where, let's say we have cores and they have sort of this mesh link, but then the memory controller maybe has really high connectivity to a bunch of cores around it or something like that. So that could be an example of an irregular topology. Um, it's actually a fairly interesting research area of how do you build heterogeneous networks or irregular networks in order to adapt to uh, different types of traffic or different uh, types of workloads. Um, OK. Uh, so the second property that topology gives you, uh, or that you can trade off with topology, is routing distance. Right? So I've used this example of a mesh. Um, a mesh you can think of as um, so if you have n nodes of giving you sort of order log n step, uh, sorry, not log n, square root of n steps uh, on average to get from one node to another, right? So um, if you have n nodes in, uh, in total, this dimension is order square root n, and this dimension is order square root n. Uh, if you can't see that, uh, sorry. But uh, OK, so basically to get from here to here, this is order square root n steps, right? That's in contrast to something like, um, just to use a trivial example, something like a ring. Um, right, so a ring is where you have 
a bunch of nodes, and each node only connects to its immediate neighbor, and they form something like a circle, right? So in a ring, if you have n nodes, you have on average n over two hops to get to your destination, right? Or if it's bidirectional, n over four. But uh, basically, you have to go order n hops. So a topology actually gives you this trade-off on the number of links or hops, right? And in general, the, the intuition is the more connected your network is, so the more links you place, then the shorter number of hops you have to traverse because you have uh, basically more uh, connectivity in your network, right? Um, okay, and then connected to that is this uh, diameter. So diameter is basically an upper limit or the, the maximum routing distance, right? So in a mesh, um, let's say we have a four by four mesh, the diameter would be seven because the worst case is from here to here and here to here. Um, sorry, six, six. Um, whereas in a ring, if you have n nodes, uh, let's say it's unidirectional, the diameter is actually n minus one because the worst case is you go to the furthest node, right? Okay, and then average distance is just another, um, another metric off of routing distance, so instead of the worst case, that's just the expected or the average case, right? So you can imagine, um, you know, there's this trade-off with performance where you have higher cost as you add nodes, uh, sorry, as you add links, but as you add links, you also bring down the network diameter and the average distance, and that gives you better performance. Okay. Another uh, sort of key measurement, and one that's often given for different types of interconnection networks, is bisection bandwidth. Um, so I don't know, how many of you guys have taken like a networking course before? Okay, so this is, I, probably you've talked about bisection bandwidth before? No, okay. That's fine. So, I guess, it, yeah, so it makes a little more sense when you have a, I guess, a bounded topology than something like the internet, but uh, the basic concept of bisection bandwidth is, let's say, I have a network. The question is, what is the minimum cut in terms of bandwidth? So basically, if I have half the network talking to the other half of the network, how much bandwidth can I push across sort of a midsection of the network? So you can imagine in a mesh, I can make a cut like this. And the question is, how much bandwidth can I push from one side of that cut to the other? And so in a mesh, it's, for n nodes, it's order log n, right? You can make a cut like that. You could do a diagonal cut, and it's square root two more. But uh, basically, uh, it's, it's a measurement of the, in some sense, the total uh, across the system bandwidth of the interconnect. Um, in something like a ring, the bisection bandwidth is only 2n, right? Uh, in a bus, it's 1n. Um, in something that's fully connected, it's, it's even better. It's order n, right? Um, okay. So, right. So it can be a little bit misleading, as the slides say, because it doesn't account for everything in the network. It doesn't account for, uh, for example, in the mesh, you may have much shorter um, hop latency because these routers are much simpler, so you can get through a router in a single cycle. Um, whereas in a mesh, maybe... Uh, you know, the routers take a little bit longer to route messages. Um, there can be other aspects as well. But this is one useful concrete metric that you can uh, talk about for a given topology. Um, and it does give you a sense of uh, sort of how well connected the topology is. Okay. And then there's this final aspect of uh, blocking versus non-blocking. So uh, this makes, uh, I think, the most sense to think about when you, when you look at an indirect network. So let me draw that again. Say that we have this indirect network. Uh, right, so in this case, the network is actually blocking because you can't route all possible combinations of inputs to outputs. Um, can anyone give me an example of a permutation you couldn't route? So how about these top two to these bottom two here, right? Because you only have one cross link here. So this network is non-blocking because, uh, sorry, is blocking um, because in essence, if you get the worst case where this switch gets two messages on its input at the same time that both want to go to these destinations, it has to block one of them, right? So you need some notion of back pressure to make that work. You need to be able to say, I can't route that message in this cycle. Maybe there's some buffer. Maybe there's a signal that you send to say, hey, stop. 
Um, but uh, in essence, there, there's this limitation. Uh, in contrast, a uh, non-blocking network is where uh, basically any possible combination of routes can be configured on the fabric. So uh, there are a few examples that I'll give later on. Uh, one example is an Omega network. Um, but, but basically the concept is you have enough path diversity, so you have multiple possible paths from a source to a destination, such that you can always find a way to route any permutation. Um, and then there, so, um, there's a sort of subset of non-blocking is rearrange level non-blocking where you actually need to move things around as you add more uh, connections. But that's, that's the basic concept. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go through a few examples of topology now. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys have seen or heard about some of these simpler ones. So bus, I'm sure everyone's heard of. Um, but there are a few more, I guess, exotic ones as well. So for example, hypercube. Uh, because you can probably imagine what hypercube is, right? Um, yeah. OK, so I guess without further ado, so a bus. Um, buses are really simple, right? Uh, starting from the 1940s, 50s, whenever we started building computers, uh, we sort of just started with buses because it's sort of the most simple thing you can do. You have a common set of wires, and any time any node needs to talk, it just puts its message on the wires. So the advantage of this first, you know, of course, is simple. And it's also actually cost effective. So all you need to do is you need to have a set of wires, and you need to have a way of arbitrating access to the wires. So you need a way of saying, uh, in this cycle, OK, it's this node's turn to talk. In this cycle, it's this node's turn to talk. Because if both try and talk at once, then you have a bus conflict. Right? So you need arbitration. Uh, but aside from that, basically, there's no extra cost be beyond a point-to-point -point link uh, from the endpoint nodes. Um, so it's cost effective. And it's actually also, so this gives a nice property when you implement a, a multiprocessor system. It's actually easy to implement coherence in this case. Um, so I don't know, have you guys talked about coherence protocols yet? No? OK, I, I think you will eventually. Um, but the, sort of the, the high level idea is that having a bus allows every node on the system to see what's going on with every other node. So that's not true for something like a mesh. In a mesh, if this node and this node are exchanging messages, then this node over here in the corner has no idea that they're exchanging messages. So for example, if you have some uh, you know, shared memory variable that these guys are passing back and forth, then, and this guy tries to do a load on that address, then there needs to be some way to coordinate there. So if you have a bus, it's actually much, much simpler, because if, say, this processor and this processor are uh, passing a cache block back and forth, this processor can watch on the bus and see that traffic going back and forth. And so it actually gives you this global synchronization point, if you will. Um, so that's sort of a nice side benefit of the bus. Um, of course, the trade-off is that you have that single synchronization point, uh, and so that gives high contention, right? That's the main downside of a bus. Um, in essence, you have capacity for only one message or only one flit per cycle, and so in the worst case, if all of your processors try to send a message, or all of your nodes try and send a message in the same cycle, uh, then you have one over n of your you know, ideal throughput for n nodes. Um, so high contention, uh, and also it's not scalable for other reasons too. For example, electrical loading. So if you build this in the most naive way, where you just have a set of wires that all of the nodes connect to, maybe with um, you know, tri-state drivers or something like that, then you have really high capacitance on those wires, right? Because they're long, um, they connect to lots of inputs, so it's a high fan, or high fan out. Um, and so this electrical loading actually means you either burn a lot of power, or you have reduced frequency, or both. Um, and so that actually limits your bandwidth, as well as gives you worse energy efficiency as you scale this to, to more nodes. Um, so for all these reasons, buses tend to be used for uh, relatively small numbers of nodes. So for example, two or four nodes, something like that. But once you get beyond uh, you know, a certain number of nodes, buses tend to um, become much less attractive. OK, so any, any questions so far? Everyone's good? OK, so sort of the next uh, step as you scale up the number of nodes um, is a crossbar. So this is sort of the next most simple thing you can do. And again, it's sort of the naive thing, which is basically connect every node to every other node. Right? So basically what this, what this does is it says, OK, if node, um, you know, if node 1 wants to talk to node 0, then you just turn on that switching element right there, and then 1 has a path to 0. Um, so basically what this does is it, it's non-blocking in the sense of any node can talk to any other node, uh, 
And because you have the full matrix connected here, uh, you can get any possible permutation. Right? So in a sense, it's the best you can do in terms of the switching fabric. You're only limited by uh, the sort of uh, the, the fact that a node can only send one flipper cycle and a node can only receive one flipper cycle. Those are your only bandwidth limits here. Um, so it, it's also, it's good for a small number of nodes. Um, the reason it's, uh, so, and it also gives you low latency, high throughput because you only have one hop between any given set of nodes, right? Because you have this full connectivity um, and high throughput because you can get every node talking to every other node in a cycle. Um, but the reason it's good only for a small number of nodes is that it's expensive, right? So basically this is N squared costs for N nodes. So, I, so I, for example, if you go from eight nodes to 16 nodes, it doesn't get twice as expensive, it gets four times as expensive, right? And so uh, this is good for sort of a medium scale, um, sort of right beyond when buses stop scaling, you, you typically see crossbars. So for example, in like four core, eight core, uh, multi-core chips today, typically they're built around crossbars. Um, but once you get up to say 16, 32, something like that, crossbars look much less attractive because they get much larger. Uh, and so this scales both area and it also scales uh, power. Um, okay, and it's also difficult to arbitrate. So basically, uh, if you think of the arbitration problem as, you know, only one node can send a message to say node two in a given cycle, you actually need a full arbiter tree uh, for sending to node two. So node two will have, uh, in this example, eight input request lines from all the other nodes saying, can I send to you, can I send to you, can I send to you? And so node two will say, okay, in this cycle, node three, you can send to me. In this cycle, node seven, you can send to me. Uh, but you basically need an arbiter per, uh, per node, and that, uh, that fan in can get fairly expensive as well. Okay. So just to give some uh, sort of concrete examples. Uh, like I mentioned, this tends to be used right after buses stop being scalable. So IBM Power 5, uh, and I think, so the first two Sun Niagara's, I think even the T4 may use it as well, I forget exactly. Um, but basically a few real processors in sort of the four to eight core range have used uh, crossbars. Uh, I think Intel Nehalem is another example, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, uh, I think it's twice as bad, right? Because in the bus, you would have, say, a wire this long. Um, here, you have two wires of that length that you're driving. So it's actually, it's twice as bad in terms of capacitive loading. Um, you, you, you could do things like, for example, if you connect here, you could actually disconnect the rest of this, um, the rest of this line here, and that could reduce your capacitive loading. Um, but it's still, it's expensive in that regard. Uh, okay, so throughput means uh, flits per cycle, right, or traffic per cycle. And so you can still get high throughput because all of, say, all eight nodes can talk to eight other nodes in a given cycle. So, so throughput is in, yeah, so the clock frequency may be low, yeah. but in terms of throughput per cycle, it's still high. Yeah. Okay, so just to give a, a little bit more of a deep dive in, uh, you know, to give an example here. Um, so the UltraSpark T2 and... Um, I believe the same uh, framework or this, this substrate is actually used for the T4 as well, um, which is the more recent out of order chip. Uh, but basically, uh, what they did was they had eight cores and they had eight uh, cache banks. So the L2 was a shared last level cache. Uh, and basically, there is a full crossbar between the eight cores and the eight cache banks. Um, so, there's, uh, so arbitration, like I mentioned, can be sort of expensive. So there's a four stage um, pipeline in order to determine who gets to transmit. Um, it's pipelines, you can still do uh, transmission every cycle, but it takes four cycles of latency uh, to get a request in. Um, and then they have some queues as well to sort of smooth things out. Um, I won't talk about this in too much detail, but basically just an example. Uh, crossbars are used in real chips and can be effective for sort of this medium design point. So uh, one, you know, one problem that you have in a crossbar is that if you have contention, so for example, let's say that node zero and node two both want to send a flit to node one in the same cycle. Uh, there's some arbiter that says, okay, in this cycle, node zero can send. In the next cycle, node two can send. But they can't both send in the same cycle because they would contend on this, uh, on this column. So one improvement you might imagine doing is actually adding buffering, right? Um, so in essence, what this, what this does is instead of having just a switching element, which 
sort of electrically connects wires at certain points, you can actually add a FIFO buffer at each cross point. Um, so basically what this means is that you no longer need uh, arbitration um, sort of on the critical path of a sender putting something on its, on its output. Um, but for example, if node 3 wants to send something, it can just send a flit right away and it goes into this buffer. And the only consideration that node 3 has in that case, or that a sender has, is whether or not there's space in the destination FIFO. So that's sort of decoupled from uh, what this arbiter is doing. And then this arbiter can take a little bit more time to actually look at the FIFOs in its column and pick one to pull traffic from, right, to pull flits from. So adding these FIFOs allows you to decouple the contention problem uh, and also decouple the arbitration. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so like I mentioned, simple arbitration and scheduling. Uh, this actually also gives you efficient support for variable size packets because previously, you know, when you pipeline things, um, there are some complications there. I won't go into details, but um, downside, of course, is that the crossbar was already expensive in terms of area. Um, this actually requires n squared buffers. So instead of just having, say, a fixed amount of buffering per processor, well, you know, which is okay, that's easy to swallow. Here, if we grow our number of processors by two, we actually grow our number of buffers by four. Um, so this is again even more costly. Okay, so to give sort of a completely different uh, example now. So, so far we've looked at uh, both the bus, which is sort of the first naive thing you would do, and then we said, okay, to make it a little more scalable, we can actually have full connectivity in this crossbar. Um, but as you scale a little bit more, you want to start thinking about uh, making things scalable, right? So we don't want n squared cost. So one uh, sort of cheap order n uh, design that's been used in a lot of real systems, in fact, is a ring. Um, so the sort of the key concept with a ring is just as the name implies, you have a number of nodes and the nodes are connected in this circular fashion such that each node only connects to its left and right neighbor. Um, and the way this works is very simple. So if, if a node wants to send a, a message, all it needs to do is put the message on the ring and the, ring will, the message will circulate around the ring until it reaches its destination. Right? So this is, um, this is nice because in essence it gives you local flow control. And what I mean by that is this node here doesn't need to communicate with, say, this node here, for example, for permission to put something on the ring. All it needs to do is it needs to look at the ring and say, is there an open slot? Right? So you can imagine the ring as sort of um, slots that rotate around. Um, so you know, in every cycle, there's something that can be in the ring in that slot. Um, all it needs to do is say, is there space on the ring in this cycle? If yes, uh, sort of mucks in my traffic. Um, and then once it's on the ring, every node only needs to pass it through. So there's no aspect of routing. Uh, traffic just keeps moving until it reaches its destination. Um, so that's nice. So it's order n cost because each router is sort of constant size and we only have a constant amount of wire uh, per node. Downside, of course, is that it's still, uh, so, so now that we're moving away from the crossbar, we no longer have the system where we have sort of a single hop or a constant number of hops from source to destination. We actually have order n latency now. So what this means is as the network gets bigger, it actually takes longer for a message to get from one node to another. And this is actually the first topology we're, we're seeing where that's the case, right? So on a bus, it's always, say, one cycle or, you know, n cycle if it cycles if it's pipelined. Um, on a crossbar as well, it's, it's one cycle or n cycles if it's pipelined. Uh, but it's always constant time based on the design. Here, as we add, as we add nodes, we actually increase the latency linearly. Um, so, in one sense, it's easy to scale because all we need to do to add more nodes is uh, sort of add more nodes into the ring, right? So we just sort of splice them in. But in another sense, if we care about performance, a ring is actually not easy to scale. And that's because the bisection bandwidth remains constant. So, so remember I talked about bisection bandwidth as if I have one side of the network uh, sending traffic to the other side of the network, you can think of the traffic across that cut halfway through the network as sort of a measure of how much global communication can the network handle, right? Uh, so in a ring, because we only have a bisection bandwidth of 2n, if, if a link carries n uh, bandwidth, then we actually can run into a bottleneck. So sort of in the, you know, imagine if this ring gets really big and every node is cooperating with some node on exactly the diametrically opposite side of the ring. Uh, what that means is that if you look at this, this link here, it's actually carrying all of the communication between half the nodes in the network. Um, so this is in contrast to something like a crossbar or a mesh where there's some notion of locality, right? 
Um, say, if this node is talking with this node, they can talk over this link in a mesh, and this node doesn't care. It's not affected. Um, so that's one down downside of a ring. Um, but so there are some uh, sort of ways you can get around this. So there have been hier uh, hierarchical or multiple ring designs proposed before. Um, I'll talk about that actually in the next slide. But um, so there are ways around scalability, but if you have a single ring, uh, it tends to run into uh, a bottleneck after a certain point because of this. Um, okay, so everyone good so far there? So to give some more real examples, uh, rings, so, okay, this slide's a little bit dated. Um, Intel Larrabee, which is sort of the failed x86 graphics chip, used a ring. Um, more recent Intel chips, so Sandy Bridge on actually use rings as well. So, you know, if you buy a new Intel laptop today, that chip is actually based on a ring. Um, IBM Cell, which is used in the PlayStation 3, that's based on rings. Um, so they're becoming more and more common for, um, for designs where you have more nodes than can comfortably scale with a crossbar. Um, okay, so mesh. Uh, this is sort of the canonical example I've used so far. So uh, a mesh is sort of the next step after a ring, right? So in a ring, we started to say, okay, we're willing to forego this all-to-all -all connectivity where every node connects to every other node in this giant matrix uh, because of cost. And so we start to move to, okay, uh, nodes only connect to their neighbors, and we can scale much more easily by doing that. Uh, in a mesh, what we're saying is, well, nodes only connect to their neighbors, um, but if you only connect them in a ring, then you have this sort of linear cost uh, as the network grows. So let's actually move to two dimensions instead of one so that we have more neighbors and we have sort of this, um, this, this shorter path distance. So a mesh uh, is, you know, a, as the name suggests, basically just a grid of nodes, and every node connects to the north, south, east, and west neighbors uh, in a 2D mesh. You can also have, for example, three-dimensional meshes or uh, even four-dimensional meshes, with hypercubes I'll talk about in a sec. Um, but the advantage of a mesh in general is that it's sort of a nice trade-off between cost and latency. So it's still only order and cost because we have one router per node and we have, on average, um, two links per node, right? So every node connects to four links, but every link connects to two nodes. So um, amortized two links per node. Um, so it's still linear cost overall. And it has an average latency of only square root of n, right? So whereas before in a, in a ring, we actually had to traverse half the nodes on average um, if it was you know, unidirectional. In a mesh, all we have to do is, uh, you, can, you can imagine one simple thing you can do to get to a destination is uh, traverse in the y direction and then traverse in the x direction, right? So in each dimension, you have square root of n nodes uh, or hops, uh, and so you, you have sort of two square root n cost. Um, so that's really nice, uh, which may, you know, makes this a really appealing design point. Uh, another advantage of a mesh is that you know, typically when we build things these days, we build a chip, right? It's not like a design in 3D space. It's, it's planar on silicon. And so the mesh is sort of a nice fit to, to, to a 2D design. Basically, uh, tiling, uh, so tiling is basically having this regular thing that we replicate in the X and Y dimensions, is already a natural way to build a large multi-core, right? So we, we design this regular thing and we just replicate it, say, 64 times. And so if we have a mesh, then it becomes really natural to build the interconnect because all we do is we have this router as part of our tile, and then we just have sort of constant length links that we can replicate as well. Um, so it fits uh, on-chip designs really nicely. Uh, it also gives us this advantage, which um, tends to give us better performance than, say, um, a ring, which is path diversity. So what that means is that there are many ways to get from a source to a destination. So for example, if we are going from this node in the corner to this node in the corner in the mesh, uh, we could go this way, right? So we could go all the way to the right, then all the way down. But say that there's some congestion here. Say there's some other application running here that's generating lots of network traffic. Uh, potentially, we could recognize that in the network, and the traffic could reach this router and then go down one hop, and then to the right, and then down again. So path diversity means we have many choices for how to get to a destination, and we can actually use those choices in order to uh, potentially get better performance by avoiding congestion. Um, so not only avoiding congestion, this, this also gives us benefits, for example, if a link fails, right? So say we have a system that uh, is fault tolerant, right? Say it's on a, on a rover on Mars, so we can't, you know, replace the chip easily. And say that this link goes bad. Uh, you know, in a ring, if, let's say actually, in a, so in a ring has uh, some notion of redundancy, but say in a ring, two links go bad, then we're done, basically. There's no way to get from here to here. 
But in a mesh, you know, even if two links go bad, for example, um, there's still a way to get from here to here. We just go through this one remaining link. Um, so this path diversity also gives us some notion of fault tolerance. Uh, and that's still an active research area of, you know, how to do that efficiently. Okay. So to give some real design points where meshes are used, um, sort of the most famous um, uh, recent example, or well-known recent example, is Telera. They actually, so this is a startup out of MIT, um, and they actually were founded on building these large mini-core chips. Um, so they have a 64-core and now a 100-core uh, actual commercial product you can buy um, that uses a mesh interconnect. Um, so that's sort of the most well-known uh, example. But there are other examples as well. Um, so for example, Intel's built some prototypes. Uh, and so uh, basically this is sort of uh, one of the leading candidates for what people will say, what people say we will build in the future. Um, Okay, so what is one problem with a mesh? One problem with a, with a mesh is that when you're on the edge, your network connectivity looks much worse than when you're on the middle. Yeah, go ahead. So, so in terms of blocking, is this a smart blocking, right? So I mean, you can't support any combination of um, So n blocking and non-blocking um, tend to mean more when, when you look at an indirect network. So when you look at an indirect network, the question is, um, can you route any permutation from the inputs to outputs without buffers in the middle? Um, here, so okay, I guess in some sense, yeah, this is actually a blocking network uh, because in the worst case, if everything converges on um, one of these nodes, you actually need buffers. Um, is that true? No, you can actually think of it as a... Well, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, usually those terms are used in the sense of uh, in, in an indirect network. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you would consider it non-blocking because you can actually, in any given network, sorry, in any given router, you can always find some output node that you can output link you can use. Um, and actually, I'll talk about that probably Wednesday when I talk about our buffer list deflection stuff. Um, but yeah, usually the terms are used in in the indirect network sense. So, okay. Okay. So in a torus, uh, sorry, so in a mesh, uh, one problem that you have is that if you're on the edge of the network, your connectivity looks worse than when you're in the middle, right? So the, the reason for that is that if you're in the middle, you have four links to your neighbors, and on average, your distance to any given node is less than, say, if you're here, right? If, if you're here on the edge, um, you have to go maybe, uh, what would this be, five hops to get down here. Um, you know, so your worst case distance is five. If you're here, your worst case distance is only three, for example. Um, and so a torus is basically, you can think of it as a mesh, but the edges wrap around. Uh, and so to build a, a torus out of this mesh, all you'd have to do is connect this link to here, this link to here, so on and so forth, and then in the other dimension as well, right? So basically what this, what this does is it allows you to wrap around in any given dimension rather than hitting the edge of a, of a plane. Um, and what this does is it gives you um, more, so it gives you symmetric performance, and in fact, it doubles your bisection bandwidth, right? So if you take this cut here, um, you know, if we have all these wraparounds, you actually have two links rather than one for an, any given row. So your bisection bandwidth actually doubles when you build a torus. Um, so, right, so it increases your bisection bandwidth, also gives you higher path diversity, because uh, basically you can think of each uh, row or column as, a, as its own ring in some sense, right? And so you can actually uh, go either direction in either row or column. Um, okay. Downside, of course, is that this is higher cost. Obviously, we, we have twice as many links, um, or sorry, twice as much bisection bandwidth. Um, so it's actually, it's only one more link, so it's n plus one links versus n links. Um, but if you think of it, uh, that one extra link is the length of the entire network. Um, so if you look at the uh, sort of total link length, it's actually twice the total link length, um, right? And so if, you so if you actually build it like this, um, you know, literally like this on chip, uh, you get this very unequal link length because the single wraparound link, um, you know, is maybe four times or eight times or however many times as long 
as your sort of single hop link. So there's one way to solve that, um, and this has been done in real systems before, and it's called um, basically interleaving or folding. So you, you, can, you can fold a torus um, by basically, instead of having link lengths of one, 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 and I guess four, you actually interleave uh, sort of two halves of the ring so that any given link is two steps long, but you don't have that single long link. Right? So you, you actually, in some sense, amortize the link length over all the links instead of having that single long wraparound. That sort of makes sense? OK. OK, so that problem can be solved. So the cost, basically, is if you look at the bisection, uh, you know, if you cut at any given point here, you have twice as many links. And every link is twice as long. But by doing that, you have twice as much bisection bandwidth and twice as many paths. So it sort of it evens out. Uh, but this is a nice way to get um, symmetric performance as well. OK, so sort of the next step. So meshes are, um, meshes are nice for planar designs, but there are a lot of machines, um, especially back in, the, back in the late 70s and the 80s, where they're actually building large interconnects sort of in, in physical space, so like large you know, supercomputer sort of things. Um, and one nice way to manage uh, connectivity at that scale is actually to use hierarchy. Um, so a common uh, design uh, in general is a tree. Uh, as you guys, I'm sure, have all seen trees in like intro CS classes. But um, the, the concept is basically the same here. So basically we have, uh, so this is an indirect network. Um, at least in most cases it's built that way. And so we have basically nodes at a bottom level. And then we have switches that join the nodes. And at some point, uh, the connections come up to a root switch. And so what this means is that if this node wants to talk to this node, it goes through this local switch, right, this lower level switch. But if this node needs to talk to this node, it needs to go up to the root switch and then back down. Um, so this is nice because it's good for local traffic. So if you have, for example, an application where, <coughs> or a system where, for example, there's some application running on these two cores, these two processors. There's some other application running over on these two cores. Uh, these nodes can talk fairly cheaply because they don't need to interfere with anything over here, and likewise over here. Now, if you need global communication, you end up getting a bottleneck because everything needs to go through this switch and these links. Um, right, so, so trees have that upside in that they fit well for local communication patterns. Um, and they actually, so they give you log n latency as well, which is better than square root n, right, um, for a given number of nodes. But, but they do have that limitation as well, if you need high global bandwidth. Um, the upside is that they're actually, they're fairly easy to lay out. So an H tree is one example of a, a radix 4 tree, or a degree 4 tree, um, that can be built in a, in a planar system, for example, uh, you know, a single chip. Um, so basically, it, it looks like that. It's just a fractal pattern where um, at each level you have this H and uh, you know, at the center of uh, sort of that level, you have your, your tree node that can connect up and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so, so it can be easy to lay out. Uh, but like I said, the root becomes a bottleneck. Um, so one way to get around that is it's what's called a fat tree. Um, and there's an example of a real machine, the connection machine 5, that did this. So uh, the idea of a fat tree, well, okay, so it's a thinned fat tree, so it's sort of a middle design point, uh, different than a fat thin tree, anyway. Uh, but the basic idea here uh, at an abstract level is you make these links bigger or wider, have higher bandwidth than these links here. So if you have, for example, a, a ratio of, um, uh, so if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, you would actually make these links have bandwidth two, and you know, if these links had bandwidth one, and so you actually could carry your entire bisection bandwidth across the root. Um, the CM5 actually had uh, radix four at every level, right? So, so every level had four times as many nodes as the previous, um, and it was a two to one ratio, which meant that the total bandwidth out of this level was two if this bandwidth was four. Um, so going up the machine, you halved your total bandwidth, your bisection bandwidth at every level, but that was better than um, you know, four to one, which it would be if it weren't a, a fat tree. Um, so so you, can, you can study this in a little more detail um, on your own, sort of the, the way they built this. They used two switches and every node talked to sort of two switches going up. Um, so that's sort of a, a nice design trick to get the, the fat tree that way. Um, easier than having switches that have sort of double length, or double width links. Um, but that's the basic idea. So you, you can address the, uh, the problem of the root bisection bandwidth 
Uh, of course, the cost is that you have basically more hardware. So you have more links, more switches. Um, another thing, so I won't talk about in detail, but uh, the thinking machine, actually, so thinking machines in general are really interesting sort of pioneering parallel machines. Uh, you know, encourage you to read about them. Um, but one interesting thing that they actually did in hardware was they had um, different sort of primitives you could use the interconnection network for. So one example is reduction operations. Have you guys talked about like reduction trees before? Um, so say that you have every one of these nodes running some computation, and you're, you're uh, let's say, computing some operation where you need to take a sum over results from every node, right? So in a conventional machine uh, that's not parallel, not highly parallel, you would have your, you know, some computation, at the end you just do a loop over an array, saying you sum all the elements up. Um, here, what you can actually do is you can use the structure of the interconnection network to help you. So this network, for example, had the capability to take sums as messages moved up the tree. So what you could do is you could say, each of these nodes will run some local computation and will produce one result, one number, and at some point, these nodes will send the result up the tree. As those results meet in the tree, they'll actually be added, and only a single message will move further up the tree. So you actually reduce the um, sort of the upward bandwidth as you move up the tree, and at the end, at the root, you have just your final result. Um, so this, this means that you don't need to send all your intermediate results to some node that will add them in, you know, in series. You actually use your tree uh, sort of to its full advantage. Um, and there are other examples. You can read that, um, that tech report from Thinking Machines, um, but it's sort of a really cool idea. Okay, so I mentioned hierarchy before um, in the context of rings, but it's actually a very general concept, right? So if you have um, a mesh by itself, uh, it's, it's generally scalable, actually sort of indefinitely, because it has linear cost. Um, but as you scale it larger, your bisection bandwidth goes by root n as your nodes go by n. Um, so at some point, you maybe want a way to get from one corner of the network to another faster, for example. Um, so one way you can imagine actually um, sort of having this, this structure where you have this global communication that's efficient and also this local communication that's efficient is by building some sort of hierarchy, right? So what this is is basically a hybrid system where, or a hybrid design where you have some interconnect sort of at a global level and then some interconnect that connects to each node of that global interconnect and is its own sort of local neighborhood interconnect, right? So one example that's, uh, take this example for, uh, for, so this is actually from one of um, you know, Professor Mutlu's research uh, group's recent tech reports. Uh, one, one thing that you can do uh, if you have rings is that you can actually have a global ring, which is sort of wide and high bandwidth, um, and gives you sort of fast communication between, say, um, far, you know, distant points in the chip. And then from each uh, ring, you know, ring stop or point on that global ring, you can actually connect smaller local rings that actually connect to your processors. And so this gives you uh, sort of this, this um, you know, best of both worlds where local nodes, so say you're running some application that runs just on these four processor nodes, these red dots here. Those local nodes can communicate very quickly because they have a small ring with uh, very fast, you know, single cycle links between them. But um, you still have relatively good communication um, if you want to talk to the other side of the chip because you have this large ring here uh, that sort of acts as an expressway, uh, if you will, from one side of the chip to the other. So it's a high bandwidth uh, you know, link that's, that's built for sort of bulk uh, transfer. Um, so in general, you can build hierarchy out of, for example, uh, meshes, meshes of buses, meshes of meshes, rings of rings, rings of meshes, what have you. Um, and each level can be designed for different trade-offs. So you know, bulk bandwidth versus latency versus cheapness versus whatever else. Um, so I just wanted to throw in that plug there. But basically, uh, this, is a, this is a nice concept that can give you better energy efficiency, and it's still an active uh, area of research. OK, so one other, um, I guess, topology I wanted to cover was the hypercube. So it's a little bit hard to visualize, because unfortunately, we're stuck in three dimensions. Uh, unless you count time. Um, basically, the idea of a hypercube is an extension of, uh, you know, uh, meshes or cubes. So if, if you take 0D, you just have one processor. Take 1D, you have a bus, right? You have um, sort of two points that communicate over a single link. Uh, if you have 2D, you have basically a mesh, where you can go up, down, you can go left, right. So you have two dimensions, right? If you have 3D, you can imagine that's a natural extension of a mesh. Um, you can, you, actually, 3D meshes can be built. 
um, where you can go up, down, left, right, uh, and forward, back. Right? So 4D is basically taking that one step further and saying, let's take two 3D meshes and connect every corresponding point between the two 3D meshes. Um, so you can actually generalize this not just to 4D, but to ND. And in general, if you have N dimensions, you have 2 to the N nodes. So you could build, for example, a six-dimensional hypercube that has 64 nodes. Um, and so there's sort of a, a nice way of uh, thinking about this if you look at the addresses in binary. Basically, every link is between two nodes whose addresses differ in one bit. Um, I'll let you think about that a bit more. But uh, basically, what, this gives you a lot of nice properties. So it gives you uh, log N latency for N nodes, which is sort of the, uh, what a tree gave you as well. Um, but your bisection bandwidth is much better than a tree, so you don't have the problem that we tried to solve with a fat tree. Um, the downside is that the cost is relatively high, right? So for n nodes, you actually have n log n links, and your radix is log n. So radix is the number of links that connect to a given node. So if you have, for example, a, a 64 node system, which is six dimensional, every, uh, every uh, node in the system has six links outgoing. If you have a 128 node system, which is seven dimensional, every node has seven links outgoing, and so on and so forth. And when we talk about router design, you'll see why that can actually get expensive very quickly. Um, you know, as you have more links coming in and going out of a router, uh, it, it basically just the area scales um, and the power scales really poorly. Um, but if you can afford the, the routers, then this actually gives you really nice sort of uniform, um, you know, low hop count, high bisection bandwidth. Um, so this was used actually fairly frequently in sort of the, the 80s, again, when we had these large um, uh, multiprocessor systems that sort of span multiple cabinets. One e famous example is the, uh, the Caltech Cosmic Cube, they called it. I think it was the 6D system. Uh, and so the reason that it, it worked well back then was that, um, uh, like I mentioned, the routers can get expensive, but back then the links were much more expensive than the routers. Um, and so this actually was a nice trade-off point. Um, so the Intel IPSC is one example. There's a startup called NCube that built these as well. Um, okay, so like I mentioned, low latency, but uh, so it's also it's hard to lay out in 2D, 3D. So this worked well when we were building physical systems, um, where we could actually you know wire things uh, sort of in three-dimensional space. Um, but it's it gets a little bit harder once you go to a 2D chip. Uh, so yeah, so this is what a 6D hypercube actually looks like, um, sort of projected on a 2D space. Um, so like I said, as you can imagine, it gets a little bit hard to wire. Um, and you can read more about that in, uh, in the Cosmic Cube. Okay, does this make sense to everyone? Cool. Okay, so so far I've given you a sort of a rundown of all of the different um, uh, direct networks, right? So I, I've talked about buses, I've talked about meshes, I've talked about rings. Um, and all of these networks, we have basically nodes that connect to some endpoint, so connect to a processor, for example, and also connect to the other nodes. And so in something like a ring, um, basically, uh, you know, it's a direct network, it's very simple. But <clears throat> uh, there are design points, or there are applications where it actually pays to have um, sort of this higher connectivity and this more uniform latency that an indirect network can give you. Um, so I'll talk now about um, multi-stage networks, which are a form of indirect network. And the basic idea is, as I drew before, you have uh, senders and you have receivers. So you can imagine you know, this and this are parts of the same node. And you have these multiple stages of switching elements between them, such that as traffic moves through the stages, it's sort of permuted around until everything reaches its destination eventually. And so one fundamental question you ask here is, uh, as we've already talked about somewhat, are these nodes blocking or non-blocking? Uh, that depends on uh, the particular ways you connect the nodes, right? So I believe this Omega network is actually non-blocking. Um, yeah, okay, so, so basically, um, so yeah, so there are a few different ways you connect these up. So there are Omega, Butterfly, Benes networks, Banyan networks. Um, there are different trade-offs in terms of sort of the wiring costs. Um, but in general, the cost is usually n log n, because uh, in order to get full, uh, for full permutability between n nodes, you need log n stages, right? You can imagine for, um, uh, say, a uh, four input, four output, you have just two stages. For eight, you have three, so on and so forth. And at each stage, you have n links that move from that stage to the next. Um, 
And your latency, however, is log in, because basically, assuming this is non-blocking for a second, you're guaranteed to move forward one stage in every cycle. And if there are only log n stages, then you have this very um, you know, nice property of you have this very low and fixed latency. OK, so uh, just to give an example of routing here, so say we, um, let's see, say we want to connect uh, this node 111 uh, to itself on the right. Um, then there's just a direct link between those. Um, say we want to connect this other node 001 down to 110. Um, we can route that as well. Um, but there's actually a conflict here, right? So uh, because there, um, basically this is the only path to get here, um, they both need this link and only one can take it. So this, I believe, is actually, yeah, so this is actually a blocking network for this reason, right? Because we don't have uh, the ability to make any permutation without uh, conflict. Um, but another example, um, and this one is non-blocking, I believe, is a delta network. Um, so here we still, um, I'm sorry, delta network is still blocking. Um, so a delta network is, is just another way to basically arrange um, these switching elements. Uh, it also has a property that there's a single path from source to destination. Um, so not all uh, permutations are supported. Um, but it was actually proposed, so this is one of the um, required readings, I believe, um, as a cheap way to replace crossbars for processor memory interconnects. Um, so here's just another variation. Um, you know, again, just another way to draw the permutations. Um, and this was used in, uh, in the NYU Ultra Computer. So this is another early 80s, you know, large scale um, computer. Um, so I mentioned briefly combining operations before. Um, so the idea here is basically we combine multiple operations. Um, so it could be on a shared memory operation or in other designs it could be something explicit uh, written by the programmer. Um, but the key idea here is that um, basically we use the structure of the network itself. So sort of this, this tree structure, this combining structure, uh, in order to perform operations within the network. And so uh, one example, so the NYU Ultra Computer, which used this Omega network, actually uh, combined these fetch and add operations. So if you had a fetch and add operation um, on the same memory address uh, sent by multiple nodes, then the switches would actually recognize those operations and combine them in the network itself. Um, so they didn't need to go all the way to the memory and then back. And so that, that improved performance. Um, right, and so this is common, for example, when you have uh, synchronization or you're, you know, uh, grabbing chunks of an array in a parallel program. Um, and so, so combining here wasn't used uh, sort of as a programmer specified explicit reduction operation, but it was uh, performance enhancement for, um, for this operation that otherwise would have had to go to memory. Okay, so uh, here's just another example of an indirect network. Um, so it's actually, it's equivalent to um, the Omega network, um, but it's just sort of another way to visualize it. Um, just, to, you know, you swap it around, the links look like that instead. Uh, this one is used in the BBN Butterfly computer, which is, again, another early 80s um, supercomputer. Um, so one, one sort of aspect of this that's interesting is that, um, you know, conflicts, so when you have multiple nodes sending messages to a single destination, conflicts actually um, lead to tree saturation. So you, you, you can see, for example, from uh, if, if everyone's sending this node zero here, there's uh, sort of this implicit tree that moves outwards. So here and then from these two nodes, um, you have this tree that basically spreads out to all of the possible sources. So if everything sends to, to this node, it sort of funnels in toward that node. And so that's, that's referred to as tree saturation. Um, so you can actually do randomization of route selection. So when you're routing um, from sources, you actually randomize if you have multiple choices to get toward a destination. Uh, and that can help sort of spread the load a little bit more evenly. Um, okay, so that's all that we're going to cover for indirect topologies. Any questions on this? Okay. I, I would encourage you to look, uh, you know, just sort of on your own um, at those papers that we referenced and sort of un understand how the, how the links work. Um, usually they're fairly regular structures. Like here you can see, you know, uh, you either go straight or swap by one, you go straight or swap by two, you go straight or swap by four. It's usually some sort of power of two um, pattern like that. Um, and then you just sort of recursively build bigger and bigger. Um, 
networks. OK, so the last thing we're going to talk about today um, is buffering and flow control. So, so far we've talked about sort of how do you build a network uh, in the sense of what is this topology, right? So that's the shape of the network, how the nodes connect with links. But once you have the nodes and the links connected, there's the aspect of how does traffic actually move between the nodes and over the links? How do you make sure that there's space for the traffic where it's going to go? Um, and how do you sort of, um, you know, make things uh, move sort of in time so they don't conflict? Um, so that's the aspect of buffering and flow control. So there is sort of this fundamental choice in network design, which is between circuit switching and packet switching. So the, the high-level analogy between these two choices is between something like a phone call and something like the internet. So when you make a phone call, you basically set up a path, right? So you call someone, and as soon as, you, uh, as soon as the other person on the other end picks up the phone, you have this dedicated connection between your phone and their phone uh, until the call ends, right? So in, in a network, if you have a, a circuit switching based network, what that means is somehow you configure all of the routers from one endpoint to another such that you have a dedicated path between the two nodes that are communicating. And that dedicated path stays set up and gives you sort of this dedicated bandwidth, right? So maybe it's one flip per cycle guaranteed um, between the two endpoints until the, the link is, uh, is taken down. Um, and so what this means is that you have this, this fast and sort of high bandwidth dedicated link. So this is useful for something like um, video streaming, for example. Um, but you have this trade-off where to set up and take down that connection, there's some latency, right? So if, if you just have a one-shot message, a uh, one-time message you want to send to some destination, this wouldn't be uh, necessarily an appropriate choice, right? So it makes sense when you have these long communications where you need the guaranteed bandwidth and you sort of amortize the, the setup cost over a long time. Um, on the other hand, packet switching is, is basically how the internet works, right? So that's the canonical example. Um, the, the key idea is that you have individual messages or packets, so, you know, as I've been talking about packets, flits, um, that sort of thing, and each packet is routed independently, and there's no sort of persistence of route, necessarily. So each packet um, could take different paths, and um, uh, there's no guarantee that, you know, if you send one packet to a node, that the next packet will also get there in a certain amount of time. So each packet is on its own, basically. Um, so this gives you sort of some desirable properties, right? So one of them is that from the router's point of view, uh, there's more freedom. So instead of having these circuits that need to be set up and need to be managed so they don't conflict, um, you have this, this choice of how to route packets, and each packet um, basically can use any free link. Um, the trade-off here is that it's, it's potentially slower, right? So because we're making basically a, a resource allocation decision at every step, so at every step a packet needs to, you know, allocate the buffer for the next step, allocate the link for the next step, and then make that step. Um, because we make that decision at every step, there's more overhead for any given packet. Uh, and so it's potentially lower throughput for that reason. Um, also, also is almost certainly higher latency than a circuit once you have the circuit set up. Right, so once you have the circuit set up, you basically just have wire delay the whole time. Uh, on the other hand, the latency of a packet depends on what the routers do. So routers need to make decisions on um, you know, allocating resources and, and computing routes and that sort of thing at every step. Um, so there's sort of this fundamental trade-off. Um, circuit switching tends to be used for some applications where it makes sense to have dedicated bandwidth. But most, uh, at least um, you know, recent on-chip networks, tend to use packet switching just because it makes more sense for uh, something like a coherence protocol, for example. So, this decision is made at the head, head, while designing the network, or once the network is set up, can you switch between using packet switching or uh, switching to electrical? Uh, so, these are, these are um, design decisions in the same way that topology is. Um, so, it, you, you can design a circuit switch, you can design a packet switch. You could imagine you could design a network that could dynamically switch between them, and that would actually be sort of an interesting, you know, control aspect of, okay, I can set up a, uh, you know, I can use a link for some dedicated circuit, or I can use it for packet switching. Um, but that would be something else you would design. Um, yeah, these are sort of high-level design categories. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, I'm, so I won't talk much more about uh, circuit switch networks in this lecture. I'll talk about packet switch networks, because like I mentioned, that's sort of the common design point these days. Um, so sort of the first thing to look at is what does a packet actually look like? So it consists generally of at least two parts, sometimes three. Um, the first part is the header, right? So I mentioned every packet is routed independently. 
And so what that means is that every packet needs to carry some header information, which says basically where the packet is coming from, where the packet is going to, what type of packet it is, maybe how long the packet is, uh, that sort of thing, right? So there's some header that's sort of this metadata or control information. And then once you send the header, once you see the header, there's some data. And so this is um, basically information that depends on the type of packet. Um, but the interconnect network doesn't see or care about what that data is. It's just a black box to the interconnect network. It's a sequence of flits or a sequence of bytes, right? Um, so for example, if this packet were carrying a cache block, then your header may say, uh, this is a cache block. And it may give you the address of the cache block. And then the data could be, say, 64 bytes of cache block data, for example. Right. And then finally, so a lot of uh, real interconnect networks actually carry um, air codes. And so the reason for this is that if you have uh, links that maybe sometimes flip a bit, you know, maybe there's some noise on the link, uh, typically you want to do something like forward air correction where you have some capability to correct for, uh, correct for errors in the transmission. Um, and usually if that's there, it's at the tail because you want to generate it sort of streaming as the packet goes out um, and then send sort of the checksum at the end. Um, but so, that, so at a high level, that's, that's what um, packets look like. Okay. So one of the fundamental decisions that uh, the router designer needs to address when they design a router or a switch in the network is what happens on contention, right? So if you only ever have one packet in the network, uh, everything's great. Basically, every link is free. When a packet arrives at a switch or a router, the router just needs to decide where does this packet go next, right? So say you have a packet going from this node to this node, and it sends starting this way. When this node receives the packet, all it needs to decide is, okay, the destination is there. Uh, maybe, it, maybe my routing algorithm is I always go uh, to the column first and then down to the row, right? So maybe it says, okay, I need to go here. At this node, the router decides I need to go here. At this node, the router says, okay, the packet's in the proper column, so now I'm going to traverse to the row, so it goes down and then it goes down. Um, but the only decision in that case is which direction do you go. Unfortunately, uh, you know, networks typically have more than one packet in them at a time. And so there's this case when a router receives two packets in the same cycle, and both packets need to use the same link. Right? So say that this router here receives two packets uh, from the top and from the left, and both of these packets are addressed to this link, or to this node rather, sorry, uh, in the bottom right. So both those packets uh, basically need to use this link here. Um, and so the router needs to make a decision. Obviously, it can't send both on the link at the same time. So what does it do? So there are basically three decisions. Uh, this is sort of a taxonomy of all the, the options that you, could, uh, that you could have. So the, the first one, and this is sort of the conventional design point, is when you have two packets that need to use the same link, you have some buffers in your router. And so you place one of the packets in a buffer and send the other packet on its way, right? And so basically, you can think of this as spreading contention in time. Because uh, first, one of the packets will go, and the other packet waits in a buffer. And then later, when the link is free, after the first packet goes, the second packet can go. And so you're, you're spreading things out in, in time. You're serializing. Uh, the second choice, and so this sort of depends on uh, you know, a copy of the data being elsewhere, is to, is to drop the packet. Um, so some networks have been designed this way. Basically, the, uh, the thought is, well, you know, if two packets contend, maybe that's rare enough that I can afford to simply drop one of them. Uh, it's cheaper at the switch because I don't need to worry about, you know, where do I store it? I, just, I don't store it. I drop it. Uh, and then at some point, the sender or some other node in the network realizes the traffic has been dropped, and so it needs to be resent, right? So maybe that's based on a timeout. Maybe that's based on a notification sent back to the sender saying, hey, I dropped your packet. Sorry about that. Um, uh, you know, but somehow you need to manage um, what happens there so the data does eventually get through. Um, like I mentioned, that, that choice has been made in, in networks. Generally, it's only a good idea when the uh, contention rate is fairly low. Um, otherwise, performance will suffer. And then the final choice, so there's been um, so, you know, recent work on this, um, as well as some sort of classical work, uh, is to misroute or deflect. And so uh, the thought there is basically, well, let's say that we're at this node in the mesh. We have potentially up to four packets coming in in a given cycle, but we also have four output links. So in the worst case, if we don't care where a packet goes, we can always pick some output link for a packet to take, right? So say even if four, you know, four packets come in, all of them uh, request to go out the right link, uh, 
right? So all of them want to go to this node here. Um, in the worst case, we can just pick one of them, send it toward its destination, send the other three in other directions. And maybe somehow, eventually, they'll figure out where they need to go, right? Um, so this, this is sort of an attractive option when, A, you don't want to drop things because that would hurt performance, uh, and B, when you don't have uh, buffers or don't have very many buffers uh, to sort of hold the packets. So you can sort of, so you can think of um, buffering, uh, like I said, as spreading out traffic in time. You can think of misrouting or deflecting as spreading out contention in space. They're sort of duels of each other. Um, but those are the, the three fundamental options. Does that make sense? Okay. So for now, I'm going to talk about uh, the first option, buffering, because that's the conventional design choice. Uh, probably tomorrow, I'll get to some more recent work that looks at the deflection choice. Okay. So that was buffering. So the second sort of aspect is, is flow control. So the question is, well, you have these buffers in the network, and you have links, um, but you need some way of basically allocating space and buffers and allocating time on the links, right? So, uh, you know, sort of a, in the base case, um, if you don't do anything, um, you know, you, you don't realize until it's too late, maybe, that a packet arrives at a buffer, but the buffer is already full. So basically, you need some way of, of reserving space ahead of time and knowing that there will be space there. Uh, and if there's not space, of holding traffic further back or further upstream until there is space. Um, so there are a few different ways of doing this that have been proposed, and I'll talk about each of them. So the first is uh, store and forward, which is basically the simplest, uh, where a packet uh, in, in whole, so the whole packet, is stored at every node along its way, and then it only moves forward when there's space in the next node. Um, and then there are others, so virtual cut through and then wormhole that sort of incrementally improve on this and get better performance. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about each. Um, but first, so back to circuit switching. So uh, you can think of circuit switching as sort of the coarsest granularity of resource allocation, right? So I'll talk about, uh, in, in the other techniques, uh, how we allocate buffers or individual packets or even individual flits. But circuit switching is even coarser grain, where we actually allocate the entire link uh, worth of buffer space or worth of links, uh, sorry, the entire um, uh, journey's worth of links at a single time. Right, and so basically the idea is sort of amortize the allocation cost and then use it um, for a long time. Um, so the way you do this concretely is typically you'll send like a probe packet or sort of a setup packet um, that traverses links and as it does, it grabs those links uh, and sort of keeps them allocated. And then once you have those links grabbed, it sort of sets up switches between them um, and you use them until you tear them down. Um, so the advantage of circuit switching, I guess I've already sort of talked about this at a high level, but there's no need for buffering, right? Because once you have the links connected, you're guaranteed that the links are part of that circuit. And so you don't need to buffer traffic at every node. You just basically can have a pipeline register or a repeater, something like that, connect the links directly. Um, so no need for buffers. Uh, there's no contention, right? So the links are basically guaranteed. They're dedicated to a single circuit. Um, and you can handle arbitrary message sizes, again, because um, basically you're just passing flip by flip all of the data from one endpoint to another you can have any length of packet, and uh, the routers don't care. Um, of course, the major downsides are lower link utilization. So unless your circuits are basically being kept utilized, uh, you know, all the time, um, this is sort of wasteful because you have, uh, you know, many, many circuits, and they can't use, they can't share links, and circuits may not be fully utilized. Um, and so you're, you're, in some sense, wasting network bandwidth. Uh, and there's also this handshake overhead. So if if um, you, know, you can't amortize the link setup over a long length of time, it, it takes, uh, th this can hurt you because it takes some time to set up the circuit. Right? You basically have a full round trip to go to your destination, set up links along the way, come back, say, okay, the circuit's ready, and then you can start sending traffic. So the message Yes, so one way to do it is you would have sort of a separate network layer that's like a message passing layer. Um, you could also imagine you could have sort of dedicated um, set up links between the circuit switching routers that say, I want to reserve a circuit going here, you know, grab a link on this path and then keep going sort of thing. Um, yeah, the basic idea is you just, you send some probe on some path. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so clearly this, this works well for some applications when you have these dedicated flows, right? But the downside is that um, in some sense, it's not general purpose because if you have all nodes sending packets to all other nodes and there's no sort of, uh, you know, uh, 
long-term uh, flow persistence, um, then, then you have low utilization. So the next, so sort of the, the first thing you can do if you move to a packet switching network is store and forward. So this is basically how um, you know, network routers work if you look at like a TCP IP network, for example, or the internet. Um, and it's sort of the most basic thing you can do in an interconnection network as well. And the idea is very simple. So uh, every router basically has some buffer space. And what happens is a packet is stored completely in the buffer in one router. Uh, it allocates space in the next router. Once there's space for the entire packet in the next router, it'll transition to the next router, and then so on and so forth. Um, so basically what this means is that, um, you know, it's simple, but this leads to high per packet latency because we need to move the entire packet to one router, wait for the entire packet to get to that router, and only when the entire packet is in the next router, then we can make the next step. Um, so I'll give an example of this in a second. Um, and it also leads to sort of a high buffer cost or a high buffer utilization because we actually need buffer space for the entire packet in each node. Um, this is in contrast to some uh, incremental improvements which are shown in a few slides which, which don't require that. Uh, so just to give an example, say we start with this packet uh, which consists of four flits. Recall a flit is just the unit moved in a single cycle. So four flits start in this source labeled S and they're being sent to this destination D on the lower right. Um, so basically what happens is first this source router um, you know, somehow has some notion or some way of allocating space in the destination router. Um, and so it knows that there's space available downstream. So it can start to send the packet. So after four cycles, all four flits move to the next router. And at that point, then that router can make the next allocation um, the decision for the next router downstream and sort of allocate space in this rightmost router on the top. Um, and then the packet moves there. Right, so it's, it uh, needs to fully arrive at that router, and then at that point it can make the next top. So, you know, the natural question is, can we do better? Is there some better allocation uh, or flow control um, scheme that we can use that actually doesn't need to serialize and get the entire packet in one place at one time? And so the answer is yes, of course. Um, so the next step that was sort of proposed, and so this is sort of early 80s now, um, is cut through flow control. Uh, so this is another form of packet-based flow control where basically uh, the key idea is that uh, in some sense it's pipeline. So as soon as the first flit of a packet reaches, um, so as soon as a header in fact reaches um, a router and resources are available at the next router, um, we can basically continue moving the flits downstream to the next step. So this is a dramatic reduction in latency, right? So instead of having um, the entire packet transitioned over every step sort of atomically, and waiting for the packet to reach there before moving the next top, we can actually pipeline things such that um, basically we only have a single flit delay between each hop. Um, so for a, for a packet of n flits, this reduces our end-to-end -end latency by a factor of n in the limit. Um, the downside of this is that we still allocate buffers and channel bandwidth for full packets. So um, I'll talk about why in a second after I give the example here. Um, so basically what happens here is, so when we start out here, we have the full packet in the source router. Uh, it has four flits. And so what happens is the source router says, um, okay, is there space in the next router for uh, this four flit packet? If yes, I can go ahead and start sending flits downstream. As soon as that first flit arrives, which has the header, so the routing information, then this next router can say, okay, I know that it needs to keep going to the right. Uh, is there space downstream? If yes, I can go ahead and send that first flit immediately on the next cycle. And so basically we sort of pipeline the packet over the network in that way. Now the reason that we actually allocate both uh, buffer and channel bandwidth for full packets is that at any point there could be contention, right? So say that, say that when we were here, um, this router in the top middle actually had another packet arrive and that packet also requested to go to the right. If that were the case, then, um, you know, obviously we can't use the link for both packets at the same time. And so say that the other packet were to take that channel bandwidth instead. So some packet coming up here went to the right. Um, so basically the blue packet we, would be blocked at the top middle router. Uh, and in that case, there's no way in this scheme for the middle router to tell the source uh, router at the top left, stop sending your packet. So basically what would happen is the entire packet would sort of flow into the middle router. So the blue packet, all four flits, would arrive in the middle router and it would basically stall there. 
So in the worst case with contention, uh, this cut-through flow control actually degenerates to store and forward flow control. Uh, you, you can think of it as sort of a, um, a skid buffer, if you've heard that term. Basically, you, you, you have the entire packet skid to a halt uh, in, in one router. So if packets are large, um, basically, this is really wasteful, right? Because statically, we may have this need for a buffer that can fit the entire packet if it needs to stop at a given router. But dynamically, uh, when, when the packets actually route in the network, may, you know, most of the time we may not need all that space because dynamically maybe the contention rate is low. Um, so we're allocating buffer space for the worst case that most of the time we don't actually need. Right? And so this leads to basically either low performance or if we provision the buffers large, um, you know, it's, it's wasteful. Yeah, so, um, so these slides haven't mentioned it, but typically the way that's done is there's some notion of credits. Um, so the idea there is that, uh, so each router will have some buffer space, and it has buffers basically per input link. And so uh, say this node sending to this node has four credits. As soon as it sends something downstream, it decrements this credit counter saying, I've used one of them. And then this node will send credits back when, when buffer space is freed up. Right, so typically you have enough credit so that's fully pipelined so you don't see that latency. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, this is, um, this is sort of wasteful if packets are large, right? So the question still is, can we do better? Um, okay, so I guess, so yeah, this is what I already talked about. So basically, um, this is the reason that we need the full packet space because the output port is blocked. We basically let the entire message sort of uh, you know, reconstruct itself in a single switch. So that, that's the worst case. And that's why we need the entire buffer space allocated. Great. So can we do better? So of course the answer is yes. Um, so the next step after cut-through flow control that was proposed was wormhole flow control. So the key idea with, uh, with wormhole flow control is, um, so again, packets are broken into flits. Um, and basically what we do is we are no longer allocating buffer space at the packet granularity, but now we're allocating buffer space at the flit granularity. Um, so credits are now not for entire packet slots, but for flit slots. Uh, so it's still the case that um, you know, the, the entire packet is basically pipeline through the network, so the, uh, the tail of the packet follows the head of the packet. Um, but now what happens is instead of the entire packet serializing in a single node uh, if there's blockage, we actually, uh, we have this credit flow and we have this flit level granularity such that if the head of the packet is blocked, the rest of the packet basically stops where it is in the network. Um, so basically what will happen is, you know, so the, this first flit, for example, um, this head flit will have space, but then maybe um, when, this, when this router tries to allocate another flit space, another flit slot here, there are no credits left because all the buffer space is used because there's some blockage. And so this next body flit will simply stay in that router. Um, so this has some nice properties. So basically, one of them is that, uh, as you remember from the, the packet format, only the head flit has the routing information. Um, but because all of the body and tail flits follow the head flit, uh, basically what happens is the head flit sets up some route. So, uh, you know, sets up, okay, this input goes to that output, and that route is persistent until the last tail flit is seen. So in a sense, you can think of this as sort of temporary circuit switching at the individual router level, right? So this head flit transitions through, makes this connection. Once the tail flit goes through, it takes down the connection. So it's not a circuit that lasts from end to end for a long time, but it's in some sense a circuit or a connection that lasts uh, sort of at a single router granularity just for the duration of one packet. Um, and so this, is, uh, so this is basically the reason that um, you know, this is fast once the, once the packet gets going because we only need to do routing once and then after that each flit can just move through in a single cycle. Um, so, right, so latency is basically almost independent of the distance for long messages because, um, you know, the limit, if you're sort of sending this continuous stream, there's just some fixed latency, um, but most of the time is, is the serialization, so is the, is the bandwidth cost. So wormhole is, um, is nice for a few reasons. Wormhole is nice because we have uh, lower latency, right? So instead of waiting for the entire packet to move uh, one router at a time and then getting the whole packet reconstructed, 
then moving the entire packet, then moving the entire packet. We basically pipeline at the float level. Um, it's also more efficient in terms of buffer utilization uh, relative to cut through because we don't need to allocate the entire buffer for the worst case. We simply allocate one float at a time. Uh, there are a few limitations though. So the main one, and you probably uh, you know, thought of this when you saw that picture in the previous slide, is what's called head of line blocking. So head of line blocking is basically where um, if the head flit can't move due to contention, so if there's some blockage of the packet in the network, it basically occupies all of the space in the network and blocks any other packets from moving across those links. Right? So if we go back to this picture here, say that this packet is blocked because there's some other packet coming through here. Um, what that means is that all of these links are actually occupied by the packet, so they can't be used by other packets, but the links themselves are idle, so they aren't actually moving any data uh, when this packet is there. Um, so this is, another basic, uh, this is another inefficiency, right? And this can actually lead to significant performance degradation if you have high contention, because you can get sort of these cascading effects, where one packet will block another packet, that, block it, that packet in turn blocks another packet, um, you know, it's sort of like snakes, if you've ever played that game, right? It's, it's, it's um, you know, high contention, it gets really bad. Um, okay, that's just an example of how it happens. Yeah, so basically, uh, the, like I said, the link is set up between input and output, so that's sort of the local circuit-ish uh, type connectivity. Uh, and once that link is set up, even if the traffic isn't moving, then some data and uh, some other queue can't reach that output because the link is already, the, the connection is already made. Okay. So here's just an example. So basically, um, right, let me go back. So basically once this uh, blue packet um, gets stuck because there's some full buffer, uh, then it can't proceed, right? So it backs up there. And now this red packet, even though it wants to go to this node here, to the right, it can't move because the input buffer uh, coming from the left is filled with blue flits that can't move downward. And so basically this red packet is stuck behind the blue packet. Um, right, so, so if the red packet had some way to get around this blue packet, it would be able to use the link because the link toward its destination is completely idle, um, but it's blocked because the blue packet is in the way. So another sort of analogy that might help, this is given in Dowley's paper actually, is this is sort of like a, a turn lane in a road, right? If you've ever uh, driven on the roads, um, you know, you have intersections where there's a dedicated left turn lane, and so cars can get out of the way and let the cars moving straight get through, but in other intersections, for example in Pittsburgh, uh, there aren't left turn lanes anywhere, right? And so if a car is turning left, uh, it blocks the intersection, and the car is trying to go straight, can't get through, even though the road ahead of the intersection is completely free. Um, so this is sort of the same idea here, right? And so uh, packets uh, can, can block, and because of wormhole, um, they actually block other packets, even though the link is free. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next major idea, and this is sort of the last step to get to where um, modern designs, at least something like uh, the Telera chips, are at, is called virtual channel flow control. So the key idea in virtual channel is that we have these, these FIFOs here, and flits blocking in these input buffer FIFOs are what cause head of line blocking. So instead of having a single FIFO, let's simply have multiple FIFOs. Right? It's a simple idea. Um, uh, in the original proposal, they actually took, they, they made this an equa area comparison. So instead of having, say, an eight flit deep FIFO, you can have two four-flit deep FIFOs, right? So it's the same cost. What we do, though, is we split the FIFO into multiple channels, if you will, and this actually allows, uh, in some sense, one packet to pass another packet. So it's like a multi-lane road. Um, and so, right, so basically you can keep the same capacity, but you can split it in a different way. It's a little bit of cost for the multiplexers and the demultiplexers and the control logic, but it gives you much better performance. And so how this works, so let's take the same example we had before. Basically, let's say this blue packet is moving along and it tries to move uh, downward toward its destination, but it's blocked because of these full uh, buffers. But now, uh, right, so it'll serialize in that FIFO, in that buffer, 
But now if the red packet tries to uh, move toward its destination, it'll take a different virtual channel in that router where the two packets meet. And so it can actually uh, move forward toward its destination. So it makes forward progress. Um, so, that, so that's the key idea with virtual channels. Does everyone get that at a high level? Great. Um, that wouldn't have due to like the Yes, yeah, so they so they can they can stay spread out in the network, but um, in this example, there basically there's enough buffer space for them to move forward to that point. Um, yeah, so the, right. So the key distinction with wormhole is that um, allocations at a flick granularity, so it can still be like cut through if there's enough buffer space for the packet to move forward, um, but it doesn't have to be. So there's no guarantee that there will be that space for the entire packet to coalesce. So in wormhole, also it's possible for a for things to like go to the Stop yeah, yeah. So it, right. So if your buffer is, is deep enough, so say that your virtual channel here, so say that the packets are all four floats and the virtual channel is four floats deep. If there's nothing else in the buffer, then the entire packet can collect in a single buffer. But in this example, you know, we have one flit of the packet that's down there, uh, with you know, in, in this note here, um, and so because we're allocating that a flit granularity, we can still have that happen. Okay, so this figure is from the, uh, the Mullins paper, ISCA 2004, that you guys are required to read. Um, this is just sort of a high-level picture of what a, a modern router looks like. So now that we've gotten at the, you know, the high-level picture of what the flow control does, um, this is how the router is actually built. So it's an input buffered router. What that means is that as flits arrive, they're placed in buffers first. So these buffers are just FIFOs, first in, first out. And then there's some allocation and arbitration logic that basically says, um, Given, given the flits that are at the heads of these buffers um, and where they need to go to make the next hop, um, it'll pick some flits to move forward. And then once that sort of you know, routing and, and arbitration happens, um, the flits are pulled off of their FIFO and then they cross the crossbar, which basically connects every input to every output, and then they move forward to their next hop. Um, so that's the high level picture. Usually it's something like a three cycle latency, so like a three stage pipeline. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more detail in the Mullins paper that you guys will see. Um, so I mentioned earlier that something like a hypercube can be expensive. Um, and in general, routers that have a high radix can be expensive. So ra again, radix is just the number of inputs and number of outputs you have. And a hypercube is high radix because you basically you connect to log n nodes if you have n nodes total. Um, the reason that is, the reason the high radix routers can be expensive is that this crossbar scales by n squared for a radix of n, right, or r squared for a radix of r. Um, and that's because uh, you, you can think of this as actually sort of a, you know, a mini interconnect within the interconnect. Uh, this crossbar connects all of the inputs to all of the outputs within the router. Um, and so here we actually have that um, sort of matrix-like structure with you know, the switch elements at every, um, at every crossing point. Um, and that's what allows a flit to move, say, from the, the north input to the east output or something like that. Um, so there, there have been you know, works on how to make this cheaper. Um, people use... Um, you know, sort of reduced connectivity or reduced permutation uh, designs, but that's, that's one of the major costs of a, sort of a modern router. Um, the other major cost, of course, being the buffer space. Any questions on that? Okay, so I, I motivated virtual channels from the point of view of how do you avoid head of line blocking, which is a performance thing, um, but there are actually other benefits for virtual channels as well. So. Um, so I think the paper you're reading from Dali talks about virtual channels from the performance point of view, but he actually wrote another paper that basically proved that virtual channels give you deadlock freedom. Um, so deadlock is where, uh, you know, at a high level deadlock is when the system stops moving because you have a cycle of dependencies. Uh, deadlock can happen in a network because um, say that you have some flit and some buffer that's waiting for space in another buffer to free up so it can move to that buffer. Right, so that's the dependence between buffers. You can imagine that you could actually set up flits such that you have a cycle of buffers, uh, say in some you know, um, large uh, ring-shaped path around the network, and every buffer could have a flit waiting for a space in the next buffer. If all the buffers fill up, then nothing can move. Right? So you can actually get into a deadlock where you have a system with completely full buffers, and there's no way for any flit to make forward progress. Um, so virtual channels actually let you avoid this um, 
just at a, at a high level by basically um, enforcing certain restrictions on which virtual channels you can use. So you can imagine, um, you know, if you could prevent the situation where you have a cyclic dependence between a sequence of, of buffers, um, you can avoid the deadlock. And so, you know, there's a proof of that in, the, in one of Dali's papers. Basically, if you enforce such that if you move from west to east to use one virtual channel, from east to west to use the other virtual channel at a high level, um, that actually avoids any cycles. Um, again, you can read the papers for more details, but um, at a high level, enforcing these, these restrictions on VCs gives you deadlock freedom. Um, you can use them for other, uh, you know, for in other ways as well, so escape virtual channels. You can, you can detect deadlock and say, I'm going to reserve one virtual channel per router for sort of this escape, where if I detect deadlock, I drain one virtual channel to another virtual channel and let the network move forward that way. Um, it can address protocol level deadlock as well. Um, I won't go into that, but you know, if you're into light graph theory, it's kind of fun to think about. So anyway, so virtual channels are useful for that as well. Um, they're also useful for prioritization. So um, I may talk a little bit on Wednesday if we have some time about uh, some recent work that actually uh, prioritized packets differently in the network based on application classes. And so the key idea there is basically um, some applications benefit in terms of application level performance more from getting network service, you know, from getting bandwidth in the network than other applications do. And so actually using virtual channels to place different classes of application traffic in different channels and prioritizing them differently, you know, and allowing some packets to pass others in the network can actually give you application level performance benefits as well. Um, so virtual channels in general are sort of a versatile concept. Uh, in general, the concept is separating traffic and uh, they can be used for many, many different uh, purposes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, so. someone asked about this before, so I, I won't talk about it in too much detail, but um, most, most buffer availability schemes are based on credits. What that means is you just have some counter, basically, that says, I know there are this many spaces downstream. Whenever you send some flit downstream to a buffer, you decrement that counter because you know that you've used one of them. Whenever one of the spaces frees up, you know, when something is removed and moves further downstream, uh, there's, there's basically a message that comes back the other way saying, okay, there's now another free space, and then you increment the counter. Um, so that's credit-based. Um, you can imagine on-off flow control. So basically this is when you get a, an explicit signal from downstream saying, um, stop, I have no more space, and then, okay, I have space, keep going. Um, so, you know, stop, start, or on-off. Um, Upside of that is that, you know, it's simple. You don't have to track credits. Downside is uh, there's some latency. So, you know, you always have to have space, for example, two flits uh, if there's a two-cycle round trip. Um, it takes some time to stop and then start up again. Um, ACNAC is uh, sort of this, um, um, basically, this opportunistic scheme where you keep sending, um, but then you hold space, and then uh, you deallocate once you get an ACK. Uh, the trade-off is downstream can drop something if there's no space left and then can act and you retransmit. Um, so it's basically a retransmit-based scheme. Downside of that is that it's inefficient because you have to hold copies until you know that it got downstream. Uh, okay, so I won't go through this example in detail. Uh, you can look at the slides, but basically this is how credit flow control works. Okay, so yeah, I won't go through the details. Uh, there's one minute left. Do you guys have any questions at all? About anything I talked about? Uh, it can, can work either way. So it can be to all possible nodes if there's like a shared buffer pool. Uh, if you have separate buffers for every neighbor, it could be individual. Um, okay, so that's all I had. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can talk to me now or email me. Um, otherwise, I'll be back on Wednesday for more. So, thanks.